the grid, a digital frontier. I pictured patriots as they moved throughout our country. Do they look like individuals or small business? Were the rallies like church? I keep dreaming of a world I hope to one day see. And then, today, I got in. Hello, fellow Americans. This is Chris Coleman, your host with the Kingdom Patriot Group. Welcome to The Grid, where faith, politics, and commerce intersect. As a Kingdom citizen and a patriot, what are the rules of engagement? We discuss that more today on The Grid. F&M Painting Company is located in beautiful Lidditz, Pennsylvania, in the heart of Amish country in Lancaster County. In business since 1996, they work with new construction, custom homes, remodels, and perform a wide variety of services. Frequently ranked as the top painting company in Lancaster County, F&M Painting is a high-quality, service-oriented organization in both commercial and residential spaces. When you call F&M Painting, you know you are getting the professionals. If a 19-year-old video gaming teenager smelling like THC shows up to paint your kitchen, you did not call F&M Painting. Their employees are held to high standards of service and excellence. That's the only way they could achieve 17 years of consecutive growth. I've known the owner, Brandon McCartney, for more than 25 years. He is a devoted family man and passionately loves God and his country. When I think of a patriot, he is the first person that comes to mind. He is exactly what American small business is all about. To get a quote today, call 717-569-3680 or visit their website at fmpainting.com. That's fmpainting.com or call 717 717- Five six nine three six eight zero. Be sure to mention that you are a Kingdom Patriot. F and M Painting Company, kind, professional patriots. Contact them today. Interested in a particular topic that you want us to cover? If so, email us at admin at kingdompatriot.us. That's admin at kingdompatriot.us. We'd love to hear from you today. This week's news and review is absolutely loaded, so unlike others, we are going to have to hit this lightning fast. Ready? Let's go. Disney tax status. So Ron DeSantis signs a bill into law that in effect has removed Disney's special tax status in Florida. Honestly, I'm not even sure how I feel about this, because I generally don't like the government going after corporations. But right or wrong, this is the bed that Disney made, and now they have to live with the consequences. They absolutely injected themselves into the middle of a political debate. And quite frankly, not just put themselves in the middle of it, decided to actually lead the charge. Therefore, keep it coming. If you want to be a political player, then maybe you shouldn't get massive tax breaks that no one else gets. And in other news, Dr. Anthony Fauci, the recently awarded American Humanist of the Year, Dr. Anthony Fauci, wants the courts to stay out of the public health crisis. Defending his stance that appealing the federal mask mandate would have been a CDC decision, White House Chief Medical Advisor Anthony Fauci explains it is a matter of principle, as he spoke to Neil Cavuto. The point he was making is that a public health decision, I think, is bad precedent when decisions about public health issues are made by people, be they judges or what have you. They don't have experience or expertise in public health. This is what Fauci told Neil Cavuto. And then he later clarified when he was was talking about the U.S. District Court judge who struck down the travel mask mandate, noting that he does respect judicial decisions, but this is a public health issue. If I can just take a minute to rant and pontificate, This is exactly what happens when a so-called expert in only one area of expertise believes that a crisis or so-called crisis should be decided by looking through only one lens. When when I mean seriously tunnel vision. My point is that if Fauci lived in 1776, he would have claimed the American Revolution was a public health crisis and should be decided by the health experts. Because we live in a country that is free, decisions regarding public health cannot and should not be made only with the idea of containing the health crisis alone. Downstream health impacts should be considered. Economic decisions should be considered. And absolutely, freedom under our Constitution should be considered as well. Also, I want to read to you Fox News story regarding Hunter Biden and his business dealings, specifically with a gentleman named Eric Schwerin. Hunter Biden's most prominent investment partner had an official sit-down with Vice President Joe Biden in 2010. Eric Schwerin, the president of Rosemont Seneca Firm, met with Biden while Biden was serving as vice president under former President Barack Obama. Schwerin is linked to a variety of Hunter Biden's foreign business dealings, past and present. Hunter's finances have come under intense scrutiny as evidence mounts showing his father was used as leverage in negotiations. The meeting with Joe Biden was one of 19 visits that Schwerin paid to the White House, where he also met with a variety of aides to the vice president. Emails from Hunter Biden's discarded laptop show a series of exchanges between Hunter and his associates and Rosemont Seneca's joint venture with Chinese investment firms Bohai Capital and BHR. 
In February of 2017, Schwerin emailed the CEO of BHR, Jonathan Lee. Previously, Lee sent Hunter his son's resume with a list of colleges that he planned to attend. Jonathan, Hunter asked me to send you a copy of the recommendation letter that he asked his father to write on behalf of Christopher for Brown University. Crony capitalism at its best. And Ron DeSantis continues to be in the news. Florida faculty are upset because Ron DeSantis signed a bill that says even if you're a tenured faculty member every five years, you should be reviewed by the Institute's Board of Trustees. Many professors are upset at this, but honestly, other than government, what other job are you not evaluated periodically, usually quarterly, semi-annually, or annually for your performance? And finally, Biden moves to end Title 42, and Governor Abbott in Texas is sending illegal border crossers to D.C. literally by the bus loads. There's just way too much to share this week. So for this week's news and review, that's a wrap. This week, our conversation dovetails with last week's topic, the gridiron prophecy. For a quick recap, let's listen in. Can I go ahead and just read the exact prophetic word that you that you wrote down? Certainly. So I'm just going to read it verbatim. For Sean Griffin posted on Facebook, Super Bowl. I don't watch sports or keep up with any. By the way, that's a shame. This year, it's being played 19.1 miles from my house at the birthplace of the infamous wardrobe malfunction. That being said, there is something on my heart about the outcome of today's game. The Patriots, like the U.S., have made some bad choices recently, scandalous in description. God is nowhere near finished with the U.S. The Super Bowl will be a metaphor for the condition of our land, a sign. The Falcons will score early, and the game will be hard fought. Many times the Patriots will be cut off. In the last few minutes, something unusual for the Super Bowl will take place, and the Patriots will win narrowly. Last week, we discussed the details of that prophecy, the fact that it was done almost two hours before kickoff. But this week, we pick that up, and we ask ourselves this question, how do we behave then? If that's true, not just this prophecy, but if we know in the end we win, and that the Lord is victorious, what does that mean? That's the question that everyone asks when it comes to becoming involved and what they can do in the moment is, what does this mean for me? Sean, welcome back as a co-host as we tackle this question. Well, thanks, Chris. There are three aspects to any prophetic word. There's the message, the interpretation, and then the application. How do we behave? How do we conduct ourselves? What does this mean for me? Those are all questions that fall under interpretation and then application. So today, we're going to talk about how to apply the message of the prophetic word in a practical way. Let's rejoin last week's conversation. So as we talk about this prophecy and this word and this metaphor that the Lord gave you, it really has brought something to mind, and I know that you and I have talked about it, and that is, if we know that we are the victors, does it change, should it change, how we go to battle? What do you think about that? It can. It can change how we go to battle because your mindset is completely different when you know that you're going to win, not in a cocky way, but in a clear-headed way. We are going to win. So what do we do? I think it helps clear your mind and clear your heart. We have business to do. We need to get this done. I totally agree. In fact, I think if you if you are not assured of the victory of a battle, then I think it opens the door for fear, for desperation, for anxiety. And all those are triggers. They are triggers to, A, not trust the Lord, but B, triggers to take matters into our own hands. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you have seen it, but I've seen people that are fighting the right fight, but they're fighting it the wrong way. They're fighting it from a perspective, what appears to me is a mindset of defeat, and it's being borne out and manifested in hysteria. Have you seen that as well? Oh, yeah. There's been a lot of that going on. There's a mix of that going on right now. So then as a Christian, if we are sure of victory, I mean, we know in Revelation, we win. And this word that you've gotten from the Lord seems to indicate that we're going to see victory in the physical and natural, but it's going to be hard fought. It's going to be down to the wire. 
and it's going to look bleak. I think those things pretty much describe where we are. So in light of that, how should a Christian behave? How should we be acting, not just from a point of victory, but in our interactions? How would you respond to that? Well, I think that it's it's imperative that we have a solid idea of how to conduct ourselves in civic affairs, because we're outside the church, and the gospel is for outside the church. We've got to be confident that the Lord wants us to, he wants us to point out righteousness. He wants us to model righteousness. Um, He wants us to care for those who trust him, and he wants us to care for those who do not trust him. And I think it's vitally important that we conduct ourselves as ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven instead of, what do they call those people in Washington that are uh, lobbyists? We're not lobbyists for the kingdom of heaven. We're ambassadors. A lobbyist has only one goal, and that is to get everything that they represent this one company for. But an ambassador uh, is looking out for the whole nation. They're looking out for the whole kingdom. And that's what we need to do. You know, Sean, (laughs) as we were talking about this, that word never came up. And boy, does that resonate in my spirit. When I think of a lobbyist, I think of someone who uses leverage, coercion, the loudest voice, Mm -hmm. everything they can to manipulate. But when I think of an ambassador, I think of a statesman. I think of someone who absolutely represents the best interests of their kingdom, but also is an expert in diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Because they understand that proper diplomacy is far more fruitful than screaming and standing up and shouting. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I really appreciate that. I, I know one thing that I wrestle with and the Lord has put on my heart a lot is to walk out this balance of what I see as two very distinct natures of Jesus. And that is the Lamb of God who willingly went to the cross, willingly suffered and took the abuse the crucifixion of many, coupled with, or in some ways almost contradictory to, the Lion of Judah, the iron power of God, the resolute nature, who even though the Lord is is slow to anger, he does get angry, and he does have righteous indignation and stands up for righteousness. And walking that out, I personally believe, is what we're called to do, but I don't see it. I see Again, we've talked about this. I see two ends of the spectrum. I see those who seem to be operating from a point of view of imminent defeat. So it's anxiety, it's hysteria, it's fear, it's shouting. Or the other side of the spectrum is quiet, meek, and completely not standing up at all. And I just don't believe God has called us to either one of those places. That's why I really love the word ambassador. So How about we take a moment and maybe give a real world example? Because our listeners are saying, yeah, I've heard that. I know that. But what does that really look like? How do you apply that in an everyday situation? So, Sean, can you think of a situation that's relevant to today where we could walk through, maybe not necessarily role play, but walk through what it means to operate from a perspective of victory, to be an ambassador, to walk out the Lamb of God and the Lion of Judah, really a kingdom patriot? Well, I, I think the most prevalent example or, you know, something that covers a whole lot of territory is what's going on with the school boards. Virtually everybody in the nation has access to a school board. You might not live in an area where there's a city council. You may or may not know who your state representative is. You may not have any access to the governor. Most of us don't. You know, you may know who your congressman is and who your senators, the senators are. But most people have no access to them. And then anybody in the federal, yeah, just not there. But we all have access to the school board. And there's a movement going on right now in the school boards across the land. And that would be a good place to start that part of the discussion. Oh, I love that example. Let, let's, uh, let's dive into this one. So let's say that I'm a concerned parent and I attend a school board meeting to discuss these particular issues. One is mask mandates, that the school board is um, adamant that mask mandates will remain in place. And secondly, 
that the school board has embraced either directly or indirectly some sort of critical race theory curriculum in the school. And in that board meeting, the school board members either show ambivalence to the concerns of the parents or outright defiance saying, we know best, this is what we're going to do. What should a parent do then? What say you? Well, I think the first thing that they should do is, you know, spend some time in prayer before they go and then make sure that you have something with you, some notes to refer to where you've got specific things that you can call out. You have um, in most of the most of the videos that we see, you have like six minutes, you have very little time. So it's very important that you have whatever details you're going to talk about written down so that you can get your point across very, very quickly, succinctly, and um, makes for a good soundbite. And utilize that six minutes as really a weapon to deal with whatever the issue is. A weapon, if you're dealing with darkness, and a tool, if you are dealing with a cooperative board. Okay, so I think that's incredibly practical. I love that. What I heard summed up in all of that is be prepared. Yeah. Don't go in there just to speak off the cuff. Be prepared. Take some of the emotion out of it so that you can share the facts. So you're, you're on that podium. You're talking to the school board members. Again, they've shown you and the other parents at this point either ambivalence or outright defiance. You're standing at the podium. You have six minutes. How do you behave in such a way that you display your ambassadorship to Jesus Christ? I would say language and self-control. It's very important to keep yourself, you know, very much composed. If you've got some tears, it's okay to let those go. It is important for people to see that this has hit a spot, especially where kids are on the line, but press through it. Don't let those tears completely consume your message. And make sure that you don't use potty language, okay? It is absolutely critical. Calling them names and using potty language is the quickest way to get you, sh to get you shut down. It justifies them shutting you up and having you dragged off by the police. But secondly, in their head and their heart, the moment they hear you speaking like that, ignore any value that you bring with it, that you have attached or strapped to your profanity or to your name calling. So what you're saying is just don't get angry. Be angry and tell them that you're angry and that you've crossed the line, but just be very careful that you are communicating the anger and not demonstrating it. You know, I was debating you there just for a second to see what you would say. You know, this is, this is not necessarily a plug for this book, but Sean, I know we talked a little bit earlier about this book that I've been reading called Good and Angry, and where the author, Pallison, talks about the constructive displeasure of mercy. And what he talks about, I know it sounds like I'm digressing here, but this is, I think is uh, an important tie-in. He talks about how it's actually, uh, anger can be a good thing. God gets angry. He gets angry at sin. He gets angry at things that hurt his people. He gets angry at things that are unholy. But through his anger, mercy is his constructive displeasure. It's the manifestation of that. God's mercy is actually part of his anger response. And why I think that's important, I think you really hit on the head. We need to say we're angry. You know, Mr. Board Member, I just have to tell you right now, I'm really angry. I can understand where you're coming from. I hear that. I hear what you have to say. I just disagree. And I think this is wrong. And I think all the parents here think it's wrong as well. And we've told you, and you were elected to represent the interests of the people, not to run your, your own little kingdom. Now, I'm not going to sit here and assume what your purposes and intentions are. We're just telling you that we disagree in the direction that you're taking the school. And your job is to listen to the will of the people who elected you. And if you're not going to do that, you're really putting us in a position where we have to explore the remedies that legally exists for us, including replacing you as a board member. To me, that is the heart of how we have to approach this. Yes, we should display our, our frustration and our anger, but I love what you said, anger and name calling. If you want to shut down dialogue and debate, that's the way to do it. That's absolutely the way to do it. You just shout somebody down. 
and they will not hear you. Why? Because your message may be all important, but the delivery of the message destroys the message itself unwittingly. Yeah, it actually ends up doing just the opposite of what you're you're trying to shut them down. But what you're doing is you're shutting them down from listening to you. Absolutely. You've basically said that I am putting up a wall that the truth cannot get through. You know, it does remind me that the Bible talks about speaking truth in love. It doesn't say withhold the truth in love, nor does it say speak the truth in anger. It says speak the truth in love. And I think if we approach that heart, that mindset, then it means we don't withhold the truth, but we also don't have to try to browbeat. Why? Because we are walking out the Lamb of God and the Lion of Judah because we know that the victory is ours. Mm -hmm. It sure is. What you just said made me think of something that we often lose sight of, and a lot of people may not even understand. When you speak the truth, especially if it's the truth of God's word, the truth doesn't fail. The truth does not change. And the Lord can take that truth when it has been expressed, when it has been spoken, and he can use that truth to break the lies. Because no matter how many lies have been spoken, those lies have no standing. They have no substance against the truth. And the Holy Spirit can take that truth and cause it to resonate with anybody who heard it, especially if the hearer is somebody who has embraced the lies. And it can wreck their day and wreck their night, but more importantly, wreck their agenda because they know in their heart that that truth spoken is the truth and it is not going to change. I think that's absolutely perfect. And if I can add one thing to that, because I think what you're saying is, if we don't speak in love, the truth is not heard. And Mm -hmm. the convicting power of the Holy Spirit has to find a receptive heart. People experience conviction because they listened and they heard and they allowed the Holy Spirit to speak in their lives. If we come in guns a-blazing, so to speak, you know, shouting down our opponents, again, we've erected a wall that makes hearing nearly nearly impossible. And you're going to love this. This actually brings it back full circle. When we are going into battle from a position of victory, we can go in knowing that our words have weight and just let them do their job. Ooh, I love that. We don't need to try to take ground in a battle that's not ours to take and let the Lord do his job and let us ourselves just be the vessels through which he works. I actually think we could, I mean, we talked about school board meetings. I think we could talk about political rallies. I think we could go a lot of different ways. Let me just say that. I think we could go a lot of different ways with this conversation, but unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. I hope that our listeners have heard a little bit of our heart in this, that, um, and if I was to sum it up, when we, we must stand up for righteousness, We must push back against evil. But remember, we are kingdom citizens before we are patriots, even though we are both. As ambassadors of Christ, we need to remember truth and love, not one without the other. Sean, do you have anything additional to add? I think I would say, just tagging on to what you just said there, is don't be afraid of the label or the slur Christian nationalist when you are standing up. Think of it as a signpost that you're making a difference and then just keep going. That sounds great. I love it. So that's all we have time for today. I look forward to our next conversation, Sean. Thank you so much for sharing your heart and something that was so deep and so personal to you Uh, last week when we talked about the patient prophecy, but then today, how that translates into uh, our behavior as a Christian. Yeah, it caught me by surprise. Still does. I love it when the Lord works that way. Sean, thanks again today. We, we really appreciate it. Our listeners appreciate it. Always enjoy listening to what you have to share. It's been a blast as usual. Thanks for joining us for today's edition of The Grid. Special thanks again to our sponsor, f and Painting. To schedule your appointment today, call 717-569-3680 or visit fmpainting.com. Don't forget to visit our website at kingdompatriot.us to join the movement of faith and freedom. That's kingdompatriot.us. Join today so that together we can make a difference. I'm Chris Coleman. 
and I am a Kingdom Patriot.